thank um, my pastor and leadership for being behind me and just being there. It's, it's an honor. The New Colossus is a poem written by Emma Lazarus who penned the poem to raise money for the pedestal on the Statue of Liberty and it's in, it's in a bronze plaque inside the statue in a, at the base of it, the pedestal. The most notable portion of this poem and you all will recognize it goes like this. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be three, three, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. The epitome of our country. I once heard that quoted and I witnessed a man when he heard it quoted say, but now we have a sign that says, no vacancy. You see, words, what you say, matters. They can hurt. They can lift up. But what we say matters, especially people of the name. It speaks volumes to your psyche, where your heart is, how you really feel in an instant. Oh, I didn't mean to say that. Yes, you did. Martin Luther King Jr. said, it may very well be that we will have to repent in this generation, not merely for the vitriolic words and the violent actions of the bad people, but for the appalling silence and indifference of the good people. We can't afford to be quiet. We can't afford to put a muzzle on our words. I'm getting hit. Proverbs 11, 9 says, A hypocrite with his mouth destroyeth his neighbor, but through knowledge shall the just be delivered. Proverbs 15 and 4, A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. We have a choice. I'm not talking about the folks we're going to win out here. I'm talking to the family of God right now. I'm talking to us. It's Wednesday night. I'm talking to us. We got to be careful what we say, when we say it, who we say it to, how we say it. I can speak positive or negative, life or death, victory or defeat, but I tell you what, I choose to speak life. I choose to speak liberty. I choose to lift you up. I choose to pray for you. I choose to stand by you. I choose to love you. Nothing's going to change that. My wife don't like to hear me say it, but I say it all the time. I said, I either am going to go in a rapture or at an altar somewhere. But either way, I'm going to use my words as a witness. I'm going to use my words to speak dominion and life into folks. When they look at you with a desperate look in their eyes and they don't know what to do or what to say, some life challenge has got them bound. What you say, what you speak into their life will determine whether they go forward or give up. That's why the family of God, us, you in here, right here, right now, we need to be intentional and conscious to speak love, to love folks, to be there for them, to encourage them. I choose to love you, and I know you choose to love me, so let's love them. What he said. <laughs> well, Lord's going to have to say something now. Because what I had, I was on the way here, and he's like, ah, don't talk on that. Well, Lord, you better come up with something quick. I know you don't need to study, but I do.
You're just coasting down a river. That's all I heard. You're just coasting down a river. Has anybody ever been whitewater rafting? Anybody ever heard of whitewater rafting? <laughs> whitewater rafting is when you're rafting over white water, <laughs> which means something's happening under the surface of the water. You're just in a blown up tube that can pop, headed right for rocks that are causing waters to look white. You're just coasting down the river, knowing and paying to do it. But there comes a point usually where the, the, the river branches off. And everybody's like, all right, it's a lazy river time. Jump out. No, you jump out. I saw what we just crossed. And so they'll jump out. And they say, well, you, here's what you can do. You can either hold on to the raft or not. Two options. And I started breaking this down. I started feeling it out. This is pretty quick from on the way here. I was like, wait a minute. Here's a quick question. How do you get to hell? Anybody ask you that? No? Anybody ever heard of whitewater rafting? So, sorry, just trying to see if I can get the same response. So, how do you get to hell? And I'm thinking, going down the lazy river. How do you keep moving down? Just pick your feet up, and it'll pull you down. It'll just, you don't have to do a thing. It'll just pull you right wherever it wants to go. And so I started thinking, I'm like, man, so why is it when we feel like we're heading down life's course, and I started looking at the different trees as I'm passing, I'm like, I was six years old, I was 12 years old, I'm 20. I started going all the way down, I'm like, what if this analogy, the banks are your, your time frame, and you're, as you're progressing, you're getting older and older, you start off at six years old, and by the time you get to the end, you're 80. I mean, that's not where you end, but I'm just saying, that's where you need to, no. So, moving on. When, when you're going down, why is it that we feel like when we start heading towards Christ, which I started feeling like was the banks, they extend from start to finish. How far is God's mercy from start to finish? As we're coasting through, when do I need to reach God? At 32 years, and I, I missed it. Or is it consistent? As we're going through life, we're coasting down the river. All you have to do is look to the bank and say, God, I've got to. And you'll, you'll fight. You have to fight through the current. But you're going to fight the white water anyways. Life happens. But if we choose life, if we choose Christ and make a decision to move towards the banks, his love reaches as far as your lifespan is. You're not guaranteed 75, 85, 120, 900 years. Some of you wish you was 900. I don't. You're, you're not guaranteed. I know some people that, that passed away younger than myself that I went to school with. And I started thinking, I'm like, how far was their, their mercy? How far was God's grace to them? The whole way. As far as, as you coast down the, this river of life, there it is. There's my title. River of life. As far as you're coasting down this river, God's mercy is reaching to you. It's not too late. Right. Wherever you're at, if you're in the rapids, if you're in the still, lazy river, it's not time to just go with emotions. It's time to turn and say, God's grace is sufficient for me. God's mercy is everlasting to everlasting. God's reaching and saying, all you have to do is fight the current to get to the shore. John 14 and 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Just reach Jesus. You don't have to go back to the very beginning and start over. Just reach Jesus and you will be safe. Can we stand and give God glory in this place today? God, you are worthy. God, I just got to reach the banks. God, I just got to reach your presence.
for you are mighty and you are an ever-present help in time of trouble hallelujah Jesus let's go ahead and let that raise up in this place hallelujah the announcement it's great to have the gentlemen with us here to help serve the church aren't you glad God is helping us Would you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 18 and also Galatians chapter 3? Genesis chapter 18 and Galatians chapter 3. Wow, we had a great children's revival, didn't we? Wow. <clears throat> Just an awesome time with the Borlicks, time of training, time of children really drawing close to God. It's just awesome to see. I think one of the first people I saw receive the Holy Ghost was just like a six-year-old child standing right next to me and it just really made it real to me because they had nothing to gain or lose by it so to speak I mean you know it wasn't another gold star on my paper it's just I just sat there looking at them and just reaching out to Jesus and I'm like wow this is real and to see all these children worship thank you staff for helping, thank you for setting up, uh, decorating, and what a what a great time we had! So many people here feeling the presence of God on Sunday. What an awesome time! I think we ought to thank all the staff. Go ahead, and thank you, Lord. In Genesis chapter eighteen, verse eighteen says, "Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth." shall be blessed in him there is something that comes to all nations of the earth because of Abraham and it's amazing how in Galatians chapter 3 verse 8 he alludes to it again it says and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham saying in thee shall all nations be blessed. It doesn't surprise me that in all of this, he says that there is going to be blessing through the seed of Abraham, and we know that Jesus was a Jew. We know that he came as a Jew. And, and so there is something tied up in all of that, and I'm going to have some fun tonight with, I've just been doing some research, and I want to preach on the subject getting personal getting personal would you mind praying with me just for a moment lord we ask you to let your word touch us again mold us and shape us give us understanding let your word continually mold and shape us into what you desire and we pray that god that you would take away the scales from our eyes from our hearts god and allow us to receive more of you more understanding of who you are and what you came to do. Would you speak to us tonight? Bless the people of God, we pray in the name of Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. We know through the scripture that the gospel would have a connection to Abraham. Shortly after being saved with an incredible desire to know Jesus, I began to read the gospels. I, the people were telling me stories about healing the sick and about speaking to a dead man in a grave, and it just didn't connect for me. I, I didn't understand any of it, and I decided that if I wanted to at least <clears throat> begin to know Jesus, I would need to read about what he did, what he said, where he went, where he didn't go, who he hung around, how he interacted with people, I decided that if I watched him and listened to him, I would begin to know him. And so I began digging through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And as I delved into all of that, then it led me into the book of Acts where the people that walked with him began to respond. And then, of course, Paul meeting him on the road to Damascus and talking about him and matching. So 
matching all the things that the apostles talked about and they extended the right hand of fellowship to Paul and there's there's a desire to know him and knowing Jesus really has nothing to do with an organization it has nothing to do with a label upon some religious organization etc it it has more to do with do you know his voice do you know what he said and what he expects and and how he would respond in certain circumstances there was a woman let's call her Maria she had moved to the United States from Panama and just a week prior to this is when she came to the United States and Maria turned to her friend uh, her American friend one day and declared I have a pen and the American said you have a pain what is it what can I do but Maria merely stared with wide brown eyes and repeated this time more emphatically I have a pain a pain should I call an ambulance should I drive you to the hospital but before she had a chance to do anything it dawned on this American woman that Maria was merely asking for a pen a ballpoint pen to fill out some paperwork <laughs> I have been there before not asking for a pain but trying to understand looking that a simple request had mushroomed into a medical emergency all because somebody couldn't understand her repeated attempts to say may I please have a pen how much more of a challenge would it be in communicating across centuries of religious traditions as well as languages and cultures we know that Jesus walked the face of the earth roughly 2,000 years ago and to understand everything that he said and did 2,000 years removed is quite a miracle of itself. No wonder sometimes we find it hard to grasp what Jesus is actually trying to say to us. Some of my favorite messages that I have listened to are those which provide me a bit more understanding of him and what he did for me. When you dig into his word, and we've had some awesome Bible studies, Jack and Deshaun, they're so hungry for God, and we get so excited. Sometimes we stop and pray, amen. We, we feel the power and glory of God, and we're like, oh my goodness, I feel him. And it's, we're usually talking about some scriptural connection, and culture and what they did and, and, and what Jesus really meant by a certain scripture. And we get so excited to find that it's connected to other things. And if, if we could just find a way to fine tune our hearing to the time that Jesus walked and kicked up the dust of Jerusalem, how much more could we understand about the word of God? I just get excited when I dive in to research and find these things and say, that's why he did this and this is why she did this and this is what he meant by when he used these words it was all exciting when I find the word of God and find truths in the word of God and the words of Jesus that truly electrified crowds you think of the thousands of people that he drew 5,000 men with their wives and kids came to listen to him talk as he just before he broke the loaves and the fishes and fed them, you think, why would that many people come? His words were powerful. His words were connecting to people. They were, they were providing understanding, etc. And lives were changed all because they understood what he said and why he said it. When we study the personal side of Jesus, it can cause us to understand him better. There's no way I can get through all of the research that I've done in the last two days, but I'll try. No, I'll 
just begin. But we look at Luke 10, 38, and we see the story of Mary and Martha, and we've talked about that many times, how Jesus went and was in their home, and Martha's in the kitchen, and she's busy making dinner for Jesus and the disciples, and we find that Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet, and she's listening to him, and Martha's complaining, saying, why don't you tell her to come in and help me out? I'm it's a bit hot in this kitchen, and I, I could sure use some help. <clears throat> but if you had been a first-century Jew, you most likely would have heard a saying that was in circulation for at least 100 years at that time, and it was this, let your house be a meeting place for the rabbis and cover yourself in the dust of their feet and drink in their words thirstily. This is what was happening at the house of Mary and Martha because the gifted teachers would walk from town to town teaching from their Bible and people were expected to open their homes providing food and shelter to these wandering teachers. We find, I just casually began to think about circumstances in the word of God and you find Mary and Martha taking care of Jesus and his disciples. You find Simon, that they were sitting at meat at Simon's house when Mary came in with the box of ointment and they were there. Why? Because Jesus was a renowned rabbi of his day and he went from town to town and taught and the people heard about him and they gathered, but people provided him a place to stay. This was the culture of the day. It wasn't that Martha was his half sister or that Mary was, you know, John's cousin or it, it had nothing to do with all of that. It was the fact that these people said a teacher, a rabbi is coming to town and we will open our doors to him. Notice we find Jesus walking in the street. He was traveling from one town to another and Zacchaeus heard he was coming. And so Zacchaeus climbed up in a tree. You would think, what are the odds if I heard that Jesus was coming to town and I went to stand at the corner of Schick in 59? What are the odds that he would come by? That way, I may be sitting there for a long time, much less up in a sycamore tree. That would get quite uncomfortable. There must have been a path that preachers, teachers, rabbis followed because Zacchaeus wasn't the only one there. The fact he was up in a tree because the place was crowded. The, Zacchaeus couldn't get to him. So they must have known ahead of time which path the rabbis take as they travel from one city to the next. This is a known culture and they waited for him and Zacchaeus climbs up in the tree and Jesus sees him there as he waited. Let your house be a meeting place for the rabbi. So as much as we honor Mary for her desire to learn from Jesus, this scene shows us that Martha's hospitality was also an important help to Jesus' ministry as well. She was following the culture, the protocol, the appropriate hospitality that was expected of people, especially for the rabbi as they come by. My question for God this afternoon was, then why, if this is true, if this really was true, that Martha was doing something that was valuable and appropriate, then why did Jesus say, Mary hath chosen that good part? If what Martha was doing was right and okay, then why did Jesus say that? It's because Martha took care of the present while Mary was a bridge to the future. Let me explain that. It was customary for rabbis to sit on low pillows or chairs while they were teaching, and disciples would sit on the ground or on mats around them. That's where the phrase sit at his feet became a normality for learning from a rabbi. 
in Acts chapter 20, we find Paul actually defending or describing himself as someone who had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. This is what he was communicating. He was saying, Gamaliel was my rabbi. Gamaliel was my teacher. I am a disciple of Gamaliel. So when Mary was described as sitting at Jesus' feet, she was being described as a disciple. If that is true, which it is, then Jesus is saying there are things that we do in a church setting that are important. But the most important thing is that we find a place to sit at Jesus' feet and become a disciple because busyness is all about the day. But discipleship is about propagating the gospel to the next generation. It's about carrying it into the future. Making dinner for a pastor takes care of the day, but becoming a disciple actually pushes this thing into the future. What about the phrase, covering yourself in the dust of the rabbi's feet? Research indicates that came from either sitting at their feet, as was described by Paul regarding Gamaliel, or walking behind them on the dusty roads and following in their footsteps. One or the other, or probably both. It was following Jesus as he walked through those streets, as he kicked up the dust with his feet, with his sandals. The dust got upon me, and I became covered in the dust of my master's leading. Or we sit at his feet in the dust as he teaches and leads us and molds and shapes us. Either one is acceptable. John 12, 3 describes even yet another story. A woman that I alluded to of the name of Mary took about a pint of pure nard and expensive perfume and poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. We think, what a waste. And that was mentioned by Judas, of course. What a waste. Taking all of that ointment and wasting it in one situation. But in Matthew 26, 12, Jesus actually clarified one aspect of that story by commenting that Mary was preparing him for the day of his burial. So not only was she presenting something that was quite expensive, but he said she was anointing me for my burial. But just reading this story can cause us to miss something that the disciples would have immediately realized because of the culture of their day. Something actually so obvious to them that Jesus didn't even need to mention it. Anointing him with Expensive fragrances. Mary may well have been making a statement about who she believed Jesus was, actually proclaiming him as the Messiah. In fact, the Hebrew word for Messiah is Meshiach, which literally means the anointed one. Christos or Christ is the Greek equivalent to that. But why the anointed one? because the word Messiah alludes to the ceremony used to set apart someone chosen by God like a king or a priest. If you look up the word Messiah, you'll find that definition there. Set apart, it was a priest or king anointing. So instead of being crowned during a coronation like a typical king would be, Hebrew kings were anointed with sacred oil perfumed with extremely expensive spices. These spices were only used for consecrating objects in the temple or for anointing priests and kings. This specific oil, king anointing oil, would have been more valuable than diamonds in that day. But the marvelous scent that it left behind acted as if it were an invisible crown. Sometimes they saw, other times they sensed. You think of people that can't see him and yet know he's there. In that day when the king was anointed, you didn't even have to see him. 
you you could sense he was there I smell it he's here he's here two times in my 33 years of being saved I was in the middle of prayer one time was right over there and I believe Elias was there we were over here in the corner and as we prayed, the glory of God became so powerful. It was all, all of a sudden, it was like, wow, that's, that's not a cologne. What is that? Two times in 33 years. So I don't like, you know, float above the ground as I, you know, I do need to take a car between here and my house. But you know what I'm saying? There are times when it just, it hit me. And I looked and it was like, somebody, somebody else mentioned it. They said, I smell it. It was, there was an, uh, there was a fragrance. There was an incense that was, it just wasn't of this world. And I just, I just closed my eyes and I said, Jesus, the king is here. The king is in this room. But that scent that it left behind acts like an invisible crown. We know royalty has stepped into the rooms and sometimes we see and sometimes we sense. Even Jesus himself made a comment. He said, you have seen and you believe, but blessed are they that have not seen. I've never seen him. I've never looked him in the eye and said, oh, that's what you look like. But I've sensed him. I've sensed him. And whenever he comes around, you, I don't have to see him, but I can sense him. But in, the, in that day, there was more outward. So when, when you couldn't see him, you could still sense him because the king was anointed at his inauguration. But he also always anointed his clothes. He would take that expensive ointment and he would put it on his clothes so that no matter where he went, you don't have to see him. All you have to do is sense him and you know he's near. This is royalty, folks. He's in the room. Everything and everyone with that unique fragrance was recognized as belonging to God in a special way. In the ancient Middle East, the majesty of a king was expressed not only by what he wore, his crown, the ring he wore upon his finger, and the robes, but by his royal aroma. We know that even Esther, before she approached the king, was washed and she put on special aroma, indicating, I want to be the princess. Royalty had that royal aroma. Even after the king was anointed, we know that he would perfume his robes with precious oils for special occasions. Psalms 45, 7 says, Thou lovest righteousness, and hatest wickedness. Therefore, God, thy God, hath anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. All thy garments smell of myrrh and aloes and cassia out of the ivory palaces whereby they have made thee glad. Song of Solomon says, Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the powders of the merchant? During royal processions, the fragrance of expensive oils would inform the crowds that a king was passing by. They could sense him. And in 1 King 1, 38 says, So Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and caused Solomon to ride upon King David's mule and brought him to Gihon, and Zadok the priest took a horn of oil out of the tabernacle. See, we think sometimes when you hear that, we anoint with oil, and this smells nothing like that precious ointment smells. But they, 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 they would have the apothecaries put together all of the special spices with the oil and they anointed Solomon and they blew the trumpet and all the people said, God save King Solomon. Why am I talking all about this? Because there are indications when Jesus appeared and he presented himself many times, he was sending a message without saying it. I've been teaching Bible studies for 32 years and many times people look at me and they say, why is it, why doesn't it just say that? Why doesn't he just come out and say, hi, 
My name is Jesus. I'm Jehovah of the past. I'm the same one. Why doesn't it just spell it all out? Here it is in one sentence. <clears throat> here's who I am. Here's what you have to do to go to heaven. Thank you very much. It doesn't. He says, I will allude to things. I will lead you to things. And the Bible says, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. I'm going to throw the puzzle pieces all over the sanctuary. And if you want it, you're going to have to pick it up and piece it together. That's what God does. Now consider this. When they anointed Solomon and they cried out, God save King Solomon. Consider the striking parallel in the life of Jesus. And it happened the week before his death, right after Mary anointed him with the expensive perfume. Just as Solomon had done a thousand years earlier, Jesus rode a donkey on his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The crowd was not greeting an ordinary rabbi. This was a rabbi, and people were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel. They were saying this about a Jewish rabbi. Yet, as Jesus was hearing, as he was hearing these people crying out, calling him a king, the essence of that perfume still radiated from his royalty. She had just anointed him before that. In those days, it just doesn't go away. You can eat curry and smell it on you for a week. You know what I'm saying? If you're over in Pakistan or somewhere else over there, it, it comes out your pores, and that kind of expensive perfume doesn't go away in a few hours. They were remembering Solomon, the son of David, who long ago rode a donkey through their streets, and now Jesus was the next son of David. Most likely that smell of perfume that Mary anointed him with lingered for days, maybe weeks, upon his clothes. God may have used that act of devotion of Mary's to send a subtle but powerful message. Everywhere Jesus went during the final days of his life, he had that fragrance of royalty. Jesus smelled like a king. Pilate even asked him, he said, Are you king of the Jews? And Jesus, Jesus replied, Thou sayest. It's not a surprise that above Jesus' head on that inscription, it said, Jesus, king of the Jews. He was royalty. Imagine in the Garden of Gethsemane as Judas and the guards approached Jesus to arrest him. Judas gets close to him. The Bible says that he hugged him, kissed him like the Middle Easterners do. And imagine that. He gives him a hug and he's like, oh, man, I know who he is. And the guards that were standing there ready to arrest Jesus could smell the royalty. When Jesus was on trial, mocked, whipped, stripped naked, even then the aroma could have clung to him. There was no opportunity to stop at a hotel between the trial and the Calvary's Hill. In the message in 2 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, and I got it, thank God, in the Messiah, in Christ, God leads us from place to place in one perpetual victory parade. Through us, he brings knowledge of Christ. Everywhere we go, people breathe in the exquisite fragrance. Because of Christ, we give off. This is Paul to the church at Corinth. Because of Christ in us, we give off a sweet scent rising to God, which is recognized by those on the way of salvation an aroma redolent with life. He said, because we get close to him, because we have him in us, because of his royalty, that fragrance is coming out of us. And people sense that. Why is it that people look at us and they say, you're different? 
you're different than other people. There's something different about you. Like the young man last night at the barber shop. I've never prayed like this before. I said, was it okay? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. People are different that have royalties sent. What if I spent my life going to the beach? I've seen waves splashing against the rocks, ships floating along, people rowing past. Some people are throwing out nets. Some are cleaning fish along the way. Suddenly, someone walks up and hands me a snorkel. I put it on, put my face in the water. Suddenly, I see coral. I see more sand. I see seaweed. I see fish. It's simply a window to enjoy more of what is already in front of me. I'm not saying that what we've seen is wrong. I'm saying that sometimes the Bible gives us a window and we put that snorkel on and we put our face in the water and next thing you know, those things that were in front of us all the time, God says, look at this whole other world. And that's what I'm talking about today. The more we understand about who Jesus was, what he did, how he grew up, what he was taught at a child, how he interacted with his friends, the more God will give us a, 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 a mask that we can go underwater, so to speak, and see the things that were in front of us all the time, like Mary and Martha or Zacchaeus. It doesn't invalidate the beauty that we already enjoy. It's simply a window to enjoy more. Reading and studying the Bible as we look at it as essentially a Jewish document. It really is. It's the Old Testament is all about the Jews. The New Testament is about a Jew in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's, it's written by a Jew over half of the epistles. It's mostly a Jewish document. We look at it, and yet we look at it through United States of America eyes, born and bred. It's way different than what it was. This was not written here in the United States. This was written over there. And so to understand some things about Jesus helps us to appreciate what was happening. A common custom among Orthodox Jews is to bind small boxes called teflon to both head and arm. You see them, and they've got a, a leather strap around here, and there's a little box here or a little box on their, on their hand. They contain parchment scrolls inscribed with the ancient command. Most of them are Deuteronomy chapter 6, 4 through 8. And 6 through 8 says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way when thou liest down and when thou risest up, in verse 8, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. If you ever watch someone, watch a, uh, a, a Jew take and wrap that, that, that teflon upon their hand, they wrap the dark strand of leather around their arm. You'd be able to hear them speaking in Hebrew, echoing the words of Hosea chapter 2, verse 19. It says they, they actually quote this as they wrap this on, and they say, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. They're wrapping it on, and, as, and, and they're wrapping it, and there's something important. They're not just going through some kind of a ceremony. They're going through this, and they're quoting that, and they're saying, you're going to have a relationship with me forever. I'm going to know you, and I'm going to walk with you in righteousness and holiness. I'm going to draw close to you, and I'm going to learn of you. And the wearers of that teflon, or even called phylacteries, 
Consider them an outward sign of love that exists between God and his people. And by binding those to, his, to their arm and to their head, they're actually connecting themselves over time through, through their culture over centuries to those that did it at the time of Jesus. In fact, it's highly likely that Jesus as a rabbi actually did that every day, wrapped the teflon to his hand and to his forehead. The Jew across those centuries were making a comment that he was both bound up with God and with his law. He said, I am strapping, I am binding myself to your law. Do we look at God's word that way? And we say, Lord, this is not just some religious book that somebody makes us follow, but I want to strap it to myself. I want to bind it to myself. Well, are, are you bound? Yes, I hope I am. I hope I'm bound to this precious word because in him is life and life brings the light of men. They carefully wrap it around their hand in a configuration that forms the Hebrew letter shin. So they're not just wrapping it. They're doing it in a specific way that forms the letter Shin, which stands for Shaddai, one of the Hebrew names of God. As they are wrapping that around, they're saying anybody who knows Hebrew will understand that this is the God that I serve. Let there be no mistake. There will be an outward sign that I serve the one true God. His name is Jesus. And somewhere in my life, there needs to be something bound to me that lets somebody know who I serve. Whew, man, do you feel it? Let's lift our hands. For just a moment, Lord, let my life reflect something that indicates you are bound to me and I am bound to you. Jesus. Many times we find a Hebrew reading and praying. I've seen them in videos of the wailing wall. You see them rocking back and forth as they read and meditate on Hebrew words. There's actually a name for that. They call it davening. That rocking motion during prayer is a way of expressing that a person's whole self, body, and soul is caught up with God. An old rabbi explained that the movement of the body mimics the flickering flame of a candle, calling to mind the saying that the candlestick candlestick of God is the soul of man. This is what they're doing. They're saying, God, my soul is on fire for you. It is the candlestick that lights the way my worship unto you. And this is why they do that. And the word rabbi literally means my master. When they called him rabbi or rabboni, they were saying, you are my master. When Jesus entered in, and I am wrapping tonight's lesson up, but when he entered into history, you could call it the best of times and the worst of times. It was the best of times because the people, the Jewish people of that day were so hungry for a word from God. They were so so desirous. Their, their passion was at an all-time high saying, we need a Messiah. We are looking for a prophet. We are looking for a rabbi. Remember, there were 400 years of silence between the Old and the New Testament. They were desperate for something to happen. So when you think, what better time to come on the scenes when people are absolutely hungry for God? And yet, it was also the worst of times because Romans were unbearably brutal. They were highly taxed and harshly suppressed by these Romans. In fact, I found out yesterday that there was a town called Sepphoris. It was just three miles from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. The Romans squashed a rebellion by burning the city to the ground and then selling its survivors into slavery. This happened in 4 BC, right around the time 
of Jesus' birth. Imagine what it was like to grow up so close to such an incredible disaster. Any thought that you had of rising up against the Roman authority, you would think back to Sepphoris when they destroyed and burnt the whole city to the ground and sold everybody as slaves. You would think, is it really worth it? Do I really take a chance? And yet, even though Jesus was born right at the time that that city was destroyed, it was almost as if somebody was born right, at t right about the time the World Trade Towers came down. You would see the lights. You would see the memorial and you would hear everybody talking about it. They would say, yeah, remember when the World Trade Towers? I remember when it happened. I wasn't there. But imagine as that child grew up, they would hear about that. And Jesus heard about the city that was just three miles away where they destroyed the people and the city for rising up against. And Jesus steps onto the scene with incredible hunger, yet incredible pressure from politics and false religion. But he, what, it was the best of times, but it was the worst of times. And here comes Jesus saying, are you ready for a rabbi? Are you ready for a savior? Are you ready for a Messiah? What a challenge. We come into this world carrying the aroma of Jesus Christ in our lives. It is the best of times but it's also the worst of times. There are people that are so sick of religion. They are so sick of hearing the same thing over and over again, yet seeing no result, no change, no power. And yet it's also the worst of times. There is growing, growing pressure, growing fight against the church, trying to squash what we believe and trying to move into a more liberal and political agenda. We live in the best of times and yet in the worst of times. And I'm ready to see this world receive a savior, aren't you? Would you stand with me? It's exciting to know that the word of God is so much more deep than, than we currently know. The more we study, the more wonderful he becomes. I was quoting scripture to somebody one time, and it's amazing how much scripture some people can actually know and not really know the truth. And yet, as I quoted the scripture, that one scripture was John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And yet, then I quoted another scripture. And he said, greater love hath no man than this that a man laid down his life for his friends. It literally took the scales away from her eyes as, as she realized that God didn't send anybody. He came himself. He said, there is no innocent blood in this world. I have to make some myself. I will create my own body inside of the womb of Mary, and I will come and subject myself to the hideous torture of mankind. What an incredible revelation. And do you realize how many of the Christian world have no idea that that's true? How much more is in this word that God is saying, do you want it? Do you want my truth? Do you want to know why I did it, how I did it, who I did it for, and what I went through for you? That's what amazes me. The more I study the more I fall in love with him because I just put the Bible down on the table and I say, Jesus, you are just, I thought you were amazing. But now today, you're even more so because I see you specifically going through a detailed journey specifically for me. You did everything for somebody else. Aren't you thankful for a savior that cares? A savior that is so incredible more intelligent, more full of power, only one able to be everywhere at the same time, and yet he calls you friend. Can we come and just worship for a few minutes tonight? Come around the 
altar and just say, Lord, I want to know you. I really want to know you more. Let your word be a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path that leads me closer. I don't want to just be saved. That was when I was born into the kingdom. Help me to walk the journey and to cover myself with the dust of the rabbi. Help me to sit at your feet and get some dust on myself, on my clothes. Let me be so close to you that people can smell the spicy fragrance of that anointing oil that Mary poured on your feet and wiped it with her hair. Jesus, let me have desire to draw close to you. Let there be a desire inside of me that wants to know more, not just be Pentecostal, but God, let me be a disciple. Let me sit at your feet and hear and smell and emulate my master. Let there be a desire for me to become like you. Is that not your desire, Lord, for us to become your disciples? Help us, Jesus. Can we thank him for what he's done? Can we thank him for his incredible sacrifice? Lord, we love you today. We love you today, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for your incredible intensity to teach us, to lead us, to mold us and shape us and help us to appreciate all you've done. Help me lay down my pride as if I know everything. But God, as I continue to study, as I continue to reach, God, expand my faith because of what you've done. Expand my understanding of what you want to do through us, through me, my personal walk with you. Help me to be more effective with those that I minister to. The Bible studies at the barber shop, the Bible studies in the conference room. Jesus, I worship you. I worship you. Help me understand you. Even Paul said, oh, that I might know him, that I may know him. God, he knew all about you, but he also knew that there was more. There was more intimacy that he could have with you than he had to that point. God, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know your voice. I want to sense where you're looking. I want to sense your caution. I want to identify words in your Bible that are for me today. I want to decipher between the many voices in this world. I want to know your will on a daily, monthly, and yearly basis. Jesus, I want my life to show forth the praises of him that hath called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. Help me understand. Help me dig. Help me tear apart your word to understand its meaning. Jesus, I want you to be interesting in my life. Church has gotten mundane at times in my life, but when I dig, when I pray, when I submit to you, it comes alive again for me, and I become excited again about you and what you did and what you have for me. Jesus, I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Let's worship. I love you, Jesus. Just lift our hands. Drawing near. Open your heart to him tonight. To dwell with you.